Hello, and welcome to the High Conflict Co-Parenting Podcast. In this podcast, we explore and dive into the stress-filled world of high-conflict divorce and relationships. We offer solutions to calm your world down and allow for greater positive engagement with your children and the people around you. If you find value in this commercial and advertising-free podcast, please consider donating by pressing the Donate button so we can continue our helpful work. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, to the High Conflict Co-Parenting Podcast with Brooke Olson. And this week, we've got Eric Schoberg back joining us. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Brooke. Good to be here. We're picking up on um, a previous podcast that we did. It was number 145, if you guys want to go back and reference the timing on this. But this is episode 160, The Development of survival strategies due to poor attachment and neglect, part two with Eric Schobert. So. My turn. And George, what number am I doing here? Or do I not use a number? I'll just call it part two of. All right, cool. Um, let me move the chat somewhere else. So welcome back everyone to Unveiling Self podcast with Eric Schoberg. And my guest today is Brooke Olson of highconflict.net. And we are continuing with a previous conversation. So this is part two, where we are discussing more deeply into the realms of strategies for navigating overwhelm and struggle and in particular hypercognition. So thank you for listening and joining us. Thanks for being here, Brooke. Thank you, Eric. It's enjoyable every time we do this. Mm -hmm. So where do you want to start on this one? Um, you know, we we were working with parts and stuff with this and um, the adaptations. We um, were talking about thinking parts and you wanted to bring in starting over as a process with that as well. So um, why don't you lead it off? Okay. We'll just, we'll just run. Okay, sounds good. So something that I've been working with in myself in particular in in the last months has been this it's it comes out of buddhism and other practices of beginner's mind and the process of like starting over and being willing to hit a failure point and and ideally go to just acceptance of it and starting over like Thomas Edison with his 10,000 failures of a light bulb before he actually found one that worked. And, and what I see is that most of us, regardless of what our primary defense structures are, have a tendency to try something new that might be helpful for us in particular in our personal growth and fail at it in some fashion, either forget to do it or, you know, if it's a starting a yoga practice again, and that might be setting the time to, in the morning to do it and then not doing it. And most of us, myself included, have been, have had many modes of going into frustration or collapse or giving up or saying it's too hard or whatnot. And um, so this process of going, oh, okay, I'm, I didn't do it today for whatever reason. And so I'm going to try again. I'm going to begin again and see if I can make some adjustments to do the yoga practice in the morning, maybe do it a little bit earlier or later or go to sleep earlier or whatever adjustment I might make to do that. And, and what I see is 
you know, in in the in particular in the hypercognitive defense structures that we go into avoiding failure by not trying or uh, not trying again, and and so the trick becomes more complex here, in that people will often go well, I don't need to start again because I didn't fail. And they'll be like, okay, well, I can, you know, I don't need to start at the beginning poses that a beginner would do because I used to do a lot of yoga. And so I'm going to start with a more hard pose. And then I go into that harder pose and I injure myself. And then I'm out for a while. And, and, I've, got, and I've got an exit ramp. And I've got an exit ramp and now I don't have to do it because I'm injured and I'm, oh shit, I'm not going to do yoga now because right. that's a thing. Or we go, you know, different versions of overdoing it. Um, I got a knee injury from overdoing it. And, and so now I'm like, how do I really determine what beginning is and where do you need to be to begin? And what is the particular flavor of humility that I need to be in to actually go to the beginning and just sit there and not, not bat an eye, but go back to the beginning again and, um, and keep fumbling and keep going. And well, like, I, I think as we start with this stuff, Eric, mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of you know, what you and I've talked about in this arena <clears throat> um, functions around, um, you know, the basis of what we're talking about here is, you know, development of strategies to cope and, and to do things where we don't know how to do things. And kind of at the base of so much of this is um, there sits a pile of shame. And we're looking for ways to avoid looking at that pile of shame of whatever that's about, whether it's inadequacy or not being good enough or whatever it is, and the recycling of that story that keeps coming around for that, because there's another version of this that is in the, that comes back into the company matrix that you've developed around this as well. And Com that's- Competence that, matrix? Right, the competence uh -huh. matrix. Mm -hmm. But there's this, other, there's this other version of this, and I want to bring this in simultaneously as we talk about it, because the starting over is one thing, but there's also an adaptive strategy in some of this that says, I'm not going to quit, and that it just keeps driving the same piece right. into the ground in a, in a way that has its own negative outcome with it. As well, well. And, and I, I totally agree. And I would say that we're saying the same thing, maybe in a different way, right? Where, where if I'm failing, but I'm continuing to drive into it, and it, it becomes more and more like beating my head against the wall. That's not knowing that I'm at the beginning. Right. That's a denial of right. being like, Oh, I suck at this. And it's okay. And like, let me just go back and start from the ground and okay. see if I can stand up without injuring myself, which, which has a problem with the parts that are just really driven by some self image that I'm not this failure person that I'm, that I'm not bad. I'm, you know, and, and, that and, I'm this not, all... and that I'm not doing it wrong. Right, right. Well, and and where a lot of this stuff, and this is where it gets really interesting, sources from people's upbringings where they have many different versions of you have to do to be loved, which translates to you have to do it right to be loved. And, and if they're not loved, then they feel shame. And so the drive for beating one's head against the wall, doing it over and over again to the point of self-injury or self-destruction is coming out of shame avoiding parts. Mm -hmm. And I think right <clears throat> along that same piece, you know, as we're talking about conflict in this arena, it's where so many people get caught 
and um, they're, I'm just going to use ego, but um, I'm right, you're wrong, and we've got to keep doing it this way. And an absolute unwillingness to examine where that path is destructive because their ego is so fragile that they can't step into, I'm wrong. And to your point, going back to the beginning right. and starting to look at how to rebuild. Right. And, and I think, and it's worth kind of doing a little foray into the word ego and, and the notion that I hold around that, because many people are like, we should not have an ego or, you know, he has an overblown ego or whatever. And, and my sense of the way that I use the word, which may be different than others, is that there is, there is unhealthy egos, which are weak in right. one form or other. One version of it is actually like, I'm not worthy, I'm ashamed, and I'm collapsed, and I'm going to hide, which I did most of my childhood. Or the overblown ego, which is still weak, but it acts like it's king of the world, and it's better than everyone else, still weak. And it's dominating. And, and it's dominating and it's and it's condescending mm -hmm. and it's shaming and it's an avoidance of shame by trying to make other people feel shamed and less than. And and so what I think we are aiming for in this path is to find healthy ego, which in the in the realms of unveiling self that's that's like a facet of it like okay what does healthy ego look like what does it feel like H am i in healthy ego here am i in self here and and to be willing to even ask that question over and over again and see what's there is a very humbling thing and it's very self-directed to be like am i in self like it may be that you're not in self, but you have something in there that's going, am I in a part or am I in self? Am I in a weak ego place or am I in, am I in my confidence in myself where I can be like, oh, I'm feeling shame or I failed, but I'm okay. Like shame doesn't kill me. Whereas when I was a kid, shame was like salt on a slug. It was excruciating. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks for um you know bringing a little more focus to that ego process because i think it's really important um because there are those varying different pieces that those parts get stuck in that mm -hmm. um, lead us you know into the competency matrix of god you know i i, I want to talk about that just for a quick moment because most of the people that have listened to my podcast you know you and i have had these conversations to some degree and i know that you talk about this a lot and that is everybody wants to jump out of where they're at and not honor being where they're at in the process coming back to uh, starting from the beginning, coming back to um, that didn't work, but it maybe didn't work because I missed something. So coming back and gathering the pieces around and looking at them and what do I miss? And then adding that next strength piece into building into the next level of um, being present, being in self, being able to identify where in that ongoing process that I am still trying to figure this out along the way right. and noticing along the way what my survival strategies are, what, what has been developed that is keeping me from that process. Right, right. And to be willing to be in the inquiry, the humility, the healthy ego of asking such a question what are my coping strategies and what are my protector parts? What are my, you know, how am I trying to, how, how are my parts trying to protect little kid parts that are freaking out? 
Well, let, let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about the strategies from the perspective of some of these parts that um, Dick Schwartz talks about that are in the um, IFS model that you and I talk about and use frequently in this and how those pieces are developed. I know, you know, through my own explorations of, of this model, how some of these pieces really show up and how they are really effective in the survival of my personal being on this earth and how they develop in virtually all of us that as we can start to, to look at them, how we can honor them, be with them, mm -hmm. utilize them and not have them at the helm. Well, and, and, I, and I would say that the word utilize might be, might be a little domineering. Right. As I said that, it kind of pinged mm -hmm. and it's like be in relationship with them would be a better yeah, way. Yeah, and, and invitation. Right. right. Invitation with them. And, and, you know, if they're willing, you, we can invite them to be allies. Right. Right. Because, you know, like we can have parts that are like really fixated on details. And, you know, if they drive the bus, it makes a big mess. But if they can be consultants or allies of like, hey, it's time to clean house. Like, let's see if we can do this and we can use your attention to detail to find the dust and do a decent job. And I'm going to be there as self to be like, and that's enough. So one of these parts that I deal with all of the time, and I know that my clients do, and you and I talk about our clients in some of these realms where we're trying to um, parse out what's going on, is thinking parts, cognitive parts, hypercognitive parts. And, you know, how, under what circumstances that they begin to develop in children going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Well, certainly places where they're not seen, where they're not attended to, where they have to, where they're left to their own devices, they tend to try and figure out how to survive, how to not die, how to eat, how to, you know, not get yelled at. And, and so there's a lot of figuring out that shows up there that makes total sense. And, and the problem that I think happens in this is when it's that kind of a context that opens up the, the portal of hypercognition, typically it's opening up in a being that hasn't been mirrored, hasn't been attached to, doesn't have a self. They don't know who they are. They don't know that that they are. They're just trying to get by. They're just trying to survive. And they are in this very vigorous attempt to survive in whatever way that is. And, and in, a, in a blunt word that I really don't like to use, but everybody likes to use a lot, is kind of sometimes the development of narcissism. And it really is just coming from that place of not, not having that reflection. I mean, that's kind of where that whole word came from, from, from narcissism in Greek mythology, of not having reflection. But within it, right. within it, do you equate hypercognition to narcissism? Not necessarily, but they can be, they can be related in it. And oftentimes what we find in these pieces in that hypercognition is some real brilliance. I right. mean, there, I mean, just from the adaptation of having to figure that out and what you were talking about a little bit earlier in how that sometimes shows up as domination. Mm -hmm because they didn't, they didn't have the opportunity to fail, rebuild, go back and do it and have somebody help them figure the puzzle out so they could figure the puzzle out through reflection, through relationship. 
And it, it makes perfect sense to me that that domination of I'm right because I know because I know because they haven't gone past that bubble of it and they can't yeah. within some of their ego structures. I, I think that's accurate. And I would add that there is this lack of reflection and attunement and connection that also has a lack of embodiment. Like when they're, when they feel safe, when the child feels safe and there is reflection and care and, you know, the, there isn't threat constantly or most of the time, then there can be a settling into one's body and into the sensations of, of breath and the sensations of feeling powerful in one's body without needing to do anything aggressive with it. Mm -hmm. And, and where there's a, a sensation of warmth and connection that is given as well as received by the child, like they learn how to give love through having it be given to them. And, and where the, you know, there's where there is some cognitive support that is bound or wrapped up with power, love, and presence of the parent or the caregiver, then the cognition isn't in the urgency, life-threatening hamster wheel mm -hmm. that it can happen in those that don't have this healthy attachment and embodiment. Yeah, and, and that, that dual attention of being able to be in what I'm experiencing and have the thought process going simultaneously with that really helps solve problems. And the disembodiment of just being in the thought loses connection with everything that is in the periphery, everything that is in. Well, and it, and it loses connection with the in, interoception, the self-perception, right. the the intrapersonal, like where they don't have a sense of self. And, and I think that is so much the essence of where we become, you know, where we become hypercognitive and we become programmers and scientists and, and where we can solve things and we are all about solving things. And, you know, where we relate by solving things. Like I've been guilty of this in my life, big time of, you know, being in relationship, oh, what's, what's not working for you? How can I help you? And, and where there is a lack of attunement in me when I have done that. And it's, and it's creates disconnection. I've watched that real time. Yeah. Yeah, no. And it's, it, it is. And I've done the same thing. And it's like, the, the brain is, it, it's like this head has been taken off of the body and set and it's, over in a jar and it's doing all of this and the body has got no awareness of the causation of what it's creating internally or externally right and we're coming up on halloween so that image is really good to sit in that all right good this embodied brain yeah right yeah and then you know the strategies that come out of that disconnect you know these these places where our students our clients our relationships both externally and internally are um yearning striving wanting something that is not it, it's so amorphed in them that they can't get their hand around or their head around it and they move to dissociative strategies well i i think i think you're pointing to what happens with the hypercognitive is it is it becomes a drive it becomes a need to figure it out and it is un, it is insatiable. There is no end to it. You learn this thing and then you're like, okay, now what's wrong? And then you find the next thing and 
and and it becomes this kind of hamster wheel in hell mm -hmm. of constantly in pursuit of figuring it out and certainly been my my history and i'm i'm a recovering hypercognitive <laughs> i hope <laughs> Well, and, and along those same lines, and the reason that, you know, Eric and I are having this conversation is it, it, it's about awakening to, you know, these strategies so we can be in relationship with them because these strategies by and large keep us from ourselves and keep us from relationship with others. And without some sense of, being able to touch on them, to see what they are without going into shame. Oh, I'm wrong. Oh, I'm bad. Oh, I'm not worthy of this. It creates another cycle of um, disconnection of um, not, um, what's the word I'm looking here for, Eric, help me, of dissociativeness. There was that piece right there. I just went into dissociation <laughs> over dissociative. And then, you know, we start to find these other outside pieces, including hypercognitivity, hypercognitivity, but other forms of addiction that keep us from that attachment, that awareness of self and others and the pain that comes without, with not having it. We're in it. Our exes are in it. Our children are learning it. And just to be aware of it is a portal to starting over, to coming back to the beginning, to beginning to rebuild that foundation in a different way. And we're not going to get it right the first time. There ain't no way how we're going to get it right the first time. And we've got to be willing, like you were saying in, at the beginning of this, Eric, to go back to that first pose, go back to that first disengagement, go back to that white knuckle of, oh, sh crap, I don't know how to do this. And being okay. And, and don't let your knuckles relax in the I don't know how to do this right. to be consciously incompetent right. to circle back into the talks about the stages of competence you know I know for me when I started some of my work early on I would notice that when I started to head into things that were difficult within my therapeutic process or within relationship stuff i would feel sleepy mm -hmm. <laughs> and i'm going why is why am i sleepy here and that sleep was an escape for me i could go into a dark room and i could shut the door and i could turn off the lights mm -hmm. and i could turn everything off and dissociate yeah it's and a protector was, part right right that's a protector part. And then, you know, there develops these other uh, this dissociative components that will bring in around, a, you know, whatever addiction that happens to pop up. And those are firefighter parts. And those are all strategies that are developed internally to keep from feeling, period or feeling the feeling the bad stuff in particular yeah, but yeah feeling, feeling the period. pain of dissociation and and feeling the bad stuff but also well, wait wait what did you say the feeling the pain of dissociation well of i that's what i said but the the word was not quite the right word the pain of not being in relationship of not having yeah. relationship and or abandonment abandonment yeah and the pain, Neglect. not feeling the pain that the that the firefighter doesn't want you to feel. That's right. trying to protect you from feeling the pain. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and then, you know, having 
that be an awareness of something's not right here and where do I go back and where do I start to work with this piece and societally we look at these things as being bad not as an ad not as an adaptation to something different and I think from my perspective what I want people to hear is let's change the narrative let's move the judgment because i know for myself when i'm in these parts i still have judgment personal judgment around myself around them mm -hmm. and that begins to soften I, mean, I begin to be able to become more present but this also has to do with what you're dealing with with other people that you have been in relationship that you've broken relationship with or that have hurt you in some way and we go into they're bad and we've had these dualistic um conversations about yeah they are just in that and if we're going to disengage um from our conflict from this pain that this is causing us um, we have to be able to step into that non-dualistic look at, I got something else that I need to take care of, and it's not external. It's these internal adaptations that I have that have a judgment on that piece, quite possibly because I'm dealing with that myself. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, as you know, I'm, become more and more reticent to use the word non-dual in its fundamental accidental duality of <laughs> non and dual. But um, I, I think the place of, you know, in the IFS language of polarization, where there's a part that wants to go this way and another part that wants to go that way, and where I'm bouncing between them like a ping pong ball or a or a child of abusive parents or uh, um, of some kind of frenetic intensity that's going on that I can, I can slow down. And I think this place of rather than going towards more philosophical ideas as a solution, to just ask those parts to step back and slow down and go into that yoga pose, to go into feeling the sensations of power in my body, because the sensations of presence and cognition isn't working. And it's, it's, it's only a portion of who I am. Whereas there's much more of me that's available through my body and typically through body, there is an unveiling of um, emotion, power, and a different quality of presence. Like there's a present that isn't urgent. And, and that is a paradigm shift that leads to i think what you're pointing to in the non-dual state that is more acceptable to my philosophical brain parts that can't get caught up there <laughs> you know i think you know so much of the the fear that is lying behind you know, some of these protector parts or some of these firefighter parts. I know for me, as I've worked with my own process, and I know that this is true for you, or I think it's true for you too. I won't say I know it is. But there's a, there's, there's a fear as we get closer to being in our heart that being in our heart's dangerous. I, well, and it ratchets down harder because it was dangerous at one point. Yeah, and and I think the place where uh, you know there's a lot of notion in the world, 
And, and I think it's true to a point is like going to our heart and using love to, to solve a lot of problems is a very valuable and useful direction. But if it skips the parts that are stuck in a time and place where that word has zero meaning or it has inverse meaning where I know my father loves me because he pays attention to me by beating me or whatever the thing is. And, and so there's so many people in the world that, you know, that don't really have access to their heart. And I know that was true for me for decades. Yeah. I still struggle with it sometimes, but I'm way, way better with it than I used to be. Yeah. Vulnerability in it. Mm -hmm. um, I, wanted to, I, I wanted to bring you around to the conversation here a little bit um, in the context of what we're talking about, if you would, Eric, and talk a little bit about this, this um, development of self-like parts. Mm -hmm. in the in the context of what we're talking about right now yeah boy that's the rabbit hole for sure um you know i don't know if everybody knows the word fractal but fractal where there's this like repetition it's like where things just kind of repeat on through and and where where i have found myself thinking i was in self doing something, thinking I was in my, you know, myself, and then realized at some point, oh, that was a part. And, and where that is, uh, you know, this term in IFS of self-like parts is typically, I mean, I, I'm, I'm holding the notion, the definition of it at this point, that it's any part whether it's a, you know, a firefighter part drinking or a part that's raging or a part that's trying to control people or control their environment or, um, or whatnot, that, you know, it can be any part that is not aware that it's a part. And that process tends to be a journey to discover that that I'm in a part when I think I'm in self. And I've been kind of experimenting with myself and with some of my clients with the notion of two questions, where the two questions are things that you can pull out of your back pocket anytime you remember or anytime you're wondering about this. And the first one being, am I in self? And, you know, to answer that is, is a cryptic, long, lifelong question, which includes what is self, which is probably the least definable thing in IFS. Um, and it's, and it's kind of moves into the mystic side of this modality. Um, but if, if you have a wonderment of like, oh, maybe I'm not in self, then the second question shows up, which is, how do I get back to self? How do I get into self? How do I unveil self now? And, you know, if I have done this enough times and I can recognize that I'm, you know, obsessing over something, for instance, or if I'm, um, you know, I've raised my voice at someone, um, I can be like, oh, I think I might not be in self here. This is probably a part. And I can kind of then go in and find what practices work for me to come back to self. It might be breathing. It might be doing some fitness things. Like I like to use the, the notions of self that are similar to Dick Schwartz and IFS, but a little different. It's three words, power, love, and presence. And I check in and like, am I lacking in one of those three or two or all three of them? And if so, what do I, what can I do right now to kind of amplify that? And 
I want to something else happens. I want to tap on the brakes for that real quick for our listeners. Um, Eric's website is um, unveilingself.com. And I don't know this to be true, but I think it is. And if it's not, it should be. You have a whole power, love, and presence matrix. Yeah. That follows how these things coalesce together and are apart from one another where things get um, a little bit wonky. So um, I think it's a really good spot for everybody to go into that site and look at that matrix because it's it's spectacular. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, I, it's interesting, Mike, because I've had that matrix for some years now and and I find because it has columns and rows and it's somewhat complex and and it it fits and is valuable to me and it and it works for those that are willing to drop in and kind of get to know it but everybody else tends to go into some version of glazing over well so. i've gone into versions of glazing over with it when you were working on it and i'm going would you just let this go a little bit and put it <laughs> but but regardless of that i mean if you can if you can just grok the surface of it to some degree it's helpful right you know and if you want to go back and explore it you can explore it more but um yeah. well and and part of what i'm doing with the podcast unveiling self podcast is to kind of map in some fashion each guest where were they in the power love and presence and and at different points, like to see that, like, where was that lacking? And where was one of them lacking? And then this other notion of, um, you know, the facets of self being interpersonal within interoception, like what is my sense of myself, of my body? And then interpersonal, what's the relationship between self and other? And then omnipersonal, what is my relationship to the all and everything, whether it's Gaia or to a large community that I'm serving or part of and the country and the red states and the blue states and, and then play with those and overlay those three things with the other three things, the power, love and presence. And it, you can, you can have fun with it. And that's really what's happening on the Unveiling Self podcast, kind of more in the background, somewhat in the conversations, some more than others. But thanks for that. Well, I think it's a, I think it's a good push. I mean, what, what my goal is, and I know the same is for you um, in your podcast, is to bring more modalities, bring more consciousness and bring more um, tools in so people have a, a broader sense of this isn't this, this tiny little piece. We've got to keep expanding the awareness so we can take in more in the container right and there's so many different ways to look at it that the more ways that we can look at it the better our perceptions are mm -hmm. and the more we can let go of i wanted to bring out one other piece as we as we move deeper into this and toward the end of this one because this is only part two and this is a fractal theme the fractal theme um, we're, we're talking about thinking parts. We were talking about, um, this notion again of self-like parts mm -hmm. or, yeah. And one of the places, your experience of that, just yeah. to interrupt, like, I want to hear what you, right. what's your trailhead and your That's, experience of trail of yeah. self-like parts that's exactly where i was going yeah and for me in in this um this hyper cognitivity and it wasn't for a long time that i was in this and i was working with my ifs therapist and we were in our conversations that it occurred to me at one point that this hyper cognitive piece of mine was that self-like part that was coming in and it's like, yeah, this is me and I'm doing this and I'm, but it was just again that this is not self. 
this is this dissociated brain or this disembodied brain, if you will, that is trying to steer all of the little pieces that are inside there mm -hmm. and try to put all the sense to and the pieces to mm -hmm. that um, I have identified with myself with for a lifetime. And once I was able to take that piece away a little bit, as my stomach starts to turn a little bit, <laughs> that it was like, oh, crap. Mm -hmm. That's a part that's keeping me from this, from being here. And, you know, the reason I wanted to bring that in is this stuff is really tricky. And again, it's an adaptation. It leads us back to where we're kind of where we started today about um, where the hypercognitive, for me at least, and I think for many, many people growing up, was what you were talking about, having to figure it out, having to yeah. do it on your own. Mm -hmm. And that's scary stuff and to step back yeah. once you start to get a, a grok of that you start to be able to see some of the parts that are lying underneath that that are so terrified of not knowing yeah and and i think the, uh, another layer of this is you know you and i are both only children mm -hmm. and um i i'm believe that these this notion of hypercognitive is um, manager part. Mm -hmm. The hypercognitive is manager part. They're trying to figure it out. They're trying to control it. They're trying to manage things so that, okay, yeah, they, that they don't have to feel so much of the pain of being alone, but they could also be, you know, kids in a family with a bunch of kids, other kids, where there's like danger and, you know, parts that are violent or parts that are, you know, scream and yell or parts that are doing horrible things to their siblings and, you know, or the parents and where there is a notion of trying to figure it out to try and stay safe or trying to get some table scraps of needs met. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a trip. It's a complex little realm. And, and I think the different kind of origin stories for each person shows up as a different kind of, you know, cognitive figuring it out manager parts. And, um, you know, there are people that are, that are using cognition or cognitive parts trying to figure out how to deal with their emotional pain or their physical pain um and and they're just running around and they can get stuck all the way through adulthood in such things and and it they are they believe that they're doing the best thing for themselves with these these thinking patterns that are disembodied i think that is every time i come back into this it's like this lack of somatic experience in thinking parts and manager parts is really in it's sourced in disembodiment and a and a discomfort with um, the sensations of the body and the emotions that come and live in the body. So, for the listeners of this podcast, I' not wanting to be heavy-handed, but I'm going to be a little heavy-handed for a minute, maybe. But I think as parents and parents that are struggling so hard in high conflict, some parents have special needs children, some parents have children that um, are highly anxious because of their environment, um, because you're highly anxious 
um, in your environment, whether it is related just to this moment or to something that is in your past, if you can feel this stuff that we're talking about, if you can just kind of skip across the top of it and get a, a sense of it, um, this is our legacy. This is what we want to really work with. This is what I want um, my listeners to, to start to dip into. That's why we do these things with um, this podcast the way that we do it, because we want to crack a door open, to crack a window in, to let a little bit of um, air into the room so you can breathe this in a way that you can begin to shift this for your children as well, because this is where it starts. Mm -hmm. And it's a long journey. You're in a long journey, and they've got a longer journey than you do right now. Mm -hmm. And the more that you can do here, the more traction they'll have going forward, the more resiliency, the more container that they'll have. Mm -hmm. is that too heavy-handed i don't think it's heavy-handed i don't think it's an easy thing to do but it's certainly a trailhead of of a direction to go in and and one that most likely would include getting support from friends family coaches therapists whatever books like to learn about this and to learn about like, what is this process of, of unhooking from my past? Because a lot of people, I mean, a, a, most of what you and I talk about, Brooke, is, is really oriented towards resolving childhood hurts as a way to heal. And I know a lot of people still that are, really interested in forgetting all that stuff. And they're looking for skills to improve their ability to forget all that stuff, thinking that that's going to bring them to a better life, a better party, being better parents or partners or whatever. I think some people can actually pull that off. I don't think most people can, but that's my, that's my opinion. And, and I think it is a very interesting question to ask oneself if, you know, which fork in that road do you want to go in? Because it's a, that's a very different form of things, you know, like there's a lot of people out there that'll teach you cognitive behavioral therapy and, and positive thinking and love is the answer and all that kind of stuff. And so check it out. And if it, feels like it's working for you and and you're into it go for it but you know i i i have worked with enough people that tried that for years and then just had their life continue to disintegrate and then they start being willing to look at their shit to be in that you know the four stages of competence unconscious incompetence conscious incompetence which is really that first and most uncomfortable stage and from there maybe you can get into being more consciously competent and that's a that's a whole that's a whole ride and it's a whole nother podcast that we've already done at least one and and uh, and we'll probably do more so let's pull an end to this part too mm -hmm. And um, we'll come back and revisit some more of this for sure. I want to thank all of our listeners again for coming in and spending the last hour-ish with us and having the willingness to keep coming back, to keep telling people about our podcast, to have um, them spread this. Because I truly believe if I didn't, I wouldn't continue to do this that these are valuable. Um, they're not it in all of themselves, but I think each one of these is a possible trailhead for more exploration for each one of you. So we can 
we can stop some of the chaos in our personal worlds and hopefully a little bit of the chaos in the world at large. Yeah. So thank you again, Eric, for coming in and doing this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. It's, this is good that we get to do this together. And, and I would suggest that if you have questions regarding this topic or any of the other topics that we do here that you um, contact us at, you know, my website, info at unveilingself.com or Brooks website at info at highconflict.net. And, um, and, you know, send it on, you know, see what, see what you where what are we missing? What doesn't make sense? Or what more do you want to hear about? And um, yeah. Yeah, reach out we're both we're both available and we'll both respond and um, mm -hmm. utilize the resources and again please you know you guys all know somebody that's going through some of all of this it's a common theme in our world and this is help and it's a beginning so don't hesitate to spread it Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, everybody. And thank you, Eric. Brooke, people don't have to wait until Friday mornings to, to get more content. If this is something that's helpful for them, right? This isn't the first time you've broadcast anything or recorded anything or put anything out there in the world. What are the other ways people can be, uh, get the help more aggressively or speed up their recovery process? What materials are available for people right now? Well, I've written a book called The Black Hole of High Conflict, and it's available on Amazon and Kindle. Great. And everything that we're talking about is really um, compressed and, and put into there. So this is a really good starter place to get in and, and get your mind working and to see um, what uh, these concepts are about and, and how to start to apply them. The other place that I think that um, is valuable is to go to our website and um, look at some of the blog articles that I've written. Those are available there as well. If they go into some of these other um, arenas and that's at www.highconflict.net. So the book, the website um, are also really good places to get the material. And also um, we have classes. We have high conflict diversion program classes that um, you can get into and get some one-on-one -on -one help with this as well. And you know me, I'm aggressive. I, whatever I want to become good at or learn, I find someone who's good at it and pay them and hire them and shorten my learning curve. What if somebody just wants your help? Somebody says, Brooke has this information. He's good at something I'm not good at yet. And I want to work with him. Do you have any type of coaching or consultations or anything like that? Absolutely. I do. I do one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching for um, custody um, cases. I help people get ready for family court services. Um, if you've got that in your community, um, I work with attorneys and um, clients to help them with um, managing and strategically setting them up to um, have more successful cases as well. And how do they reach out? You want them to just go to the website or email or phone or what's the best way for them to reach out, raise their hand and say, I, I need some help. Um, they can email me. Um, my direct email is, is brooke at highconflict.net. That's B-R-O-O-K at highconflict, H-I-G-H, conflict.net. Perfect. That's everything everybody would need to get some help, right? Absolutely. Thank you, Brooke.